All right, hello everyone. It is 12 o'clock and it's time for Stories with Mrs. Reed. And we, uh, yesterday we left off on chapter 14, so we will pick up right there. Chapter 14, Calvin's Big Decision. It was Calvin's birthday. His mother had made chocolate cupcakes with jelly beans on top. Mrs. Jules passed them out to the class. Hey, Dana, said Leslie. I'll trade you my black jelly bean for your red one. Okay, said Dana. Everyone traded jelly beans. That was the most fun part of the party. Bebe was very excited. Tell everybody what you're getting for your birthday, Calvin, she said. I don't know, Calvin mumbled as he start, stared at his yellow jello, jelly bean. He's getting the best present, said Bebe. What are you getting, Calvin? asked Mrs. Jules. Calvin frowned. I don't know, he griped. I mean, I know what it is, but I don't know what it is. Huh? asked Jason. See, I usually get toys, Calvin tried to explain, but they always break or get lost or something happens to them. But this year, I'm getting something I'll never lose. I'll have it for the rest of my life. What is it? asked Terence. A tattoo, said Calvin. Oh, how neat, exclaimed Marisha. Everyone thought it was a great present. You're so lucky, Calvin, said Rondi. I wish I could get a tattoo. Instead, I got a tutu. I got a tutu too, said Dana. My parents won't let me get a tattoo, complained John. My parents wouldn't let me get one either, said Calvin. Then, for my birthday, they said I could get one. But now I can't decide what to get. My dad's taking me to the tattoo parlor after school today. I just can't make up my mind. Get a snake, said Stephen. No, get an eagle, said Dee Dee. They're the best. A dead rat, suggested Kathy. I just don't know, said Calvin. I never had to make such a tough decision. Nothing else I do matters very much. It's not like choosing jelly beans. If you pick the wrong color jelly bean, big deal. You can always spit it out. But once you get a tattoo, you can't change your mind. You can't erase tattoos. Whatever I get, I'll have to have for the rest of my life. Get a lady, said Jason. Calvin shook his head. I don't know. I just don't know. Where are you going to put your tattoo? asked Allison. Calvin threw up his hands. I don't know. You should put it on your arm, said Myron. That's the best place for tattoos. You're crazy, Myron, said Todd. Put it on your chest, Calvin. I know where you should put it, said Dana. But I can't say. She giggles like a maniac. Then she whispered it in Jenny's ear. Jenny giggled too. All day, everyone had lots of suggestions for Calvin. They told him what kind of tattoo he should get and where he should put it. A rainbow on his forehead, a flower on his cheek, an anchor on his arm. It was easy for the others to make, make suggestions. They wouldn't have to live with it for the rest of their lives. I just don't know, Calvin repeated over and over again. Bibi drew a lot of pictures for him in case he wanted to choose one of those. She drew lions, tigers, buffaloes, and butterflies. If you like one, I can draw it on your skin for you, said Bibi. Then the tattoo man can trace over it. I just don't know, muttered Calvin. I just don't know. After school, Calvin's father picked him up and drove him to the tattoo parlor. The next day, when he walked into class, everybody stared at him. They couldn't see a tattoo. Did you get one? asked Marisha. Calvin smiled. Yup, he said. Where is it? asked Jason. Dana gasped. I know where, she exclaimed. She and Jenny giggled. Well, what'd you get? asked Todd. It was a real tough decision, said Calvin. I almost got a leopard fighting a snake, but then my dad told me to think about it. He said it was sort of like getting a second nose. You may think you want another nose, because that way, if one nose gets stuffed up, you can breathe through the other nose. But then he asked me, Calvin, do you really want two noses? Your father is very wise, said Mrs. Jules. Calvin nodded. That made me think, he said. I decided I didn't want a snake and a leopard fighting on my body for the rest of my life. I suddenly knew exactly what I wanted. 
He pulled up his left pant leg. There was a small tattoo just above his ankle. Everyone crowded around to look at it. A potato? exclaimed Leslie. How stupid. That's the worst tattoo in the world, said Mac. They all thought it was a dumb tattoo. Anything is better than a potato, said Jason. It's a pretty potato, said Bebe, trying to be nice. I wish I could draw potatoes that good. But even Bebe thought it was a dumb tattoo. I like potatoes, said Calvin. I would hope so, said Mrs. Jules. Calvin could tell Mrs. Jules didn't like his tattoo either. I would have gotten an eagle, said Dee Dee, soaring across the sky. Not me, said Terence. I would have gotten a lion. I would have gotten a kangaroo, said Leslie. All day, everyone told Calvin what they would have gotten. A fire-breathing dragon, a lightning bolt, a creature from outer space. None of them said they would have gotten a potato. But Calvin knew better. He knew it was easy for his friends to say that they would have gotten something else, because they really hadn't had to choose. He was the only one who really knew what it was like to pick a tattoo. Even Mrs. Jules didn't know that. He looked at his potato. He smiled. It made him happy. He was sure he had made the right choice. At least, he was pretty sure. Chapter 15. She's back! Dee Dee ran across the playground screaming. At first, Lewis thought she was just having fun, but then he realized something was wrong. He hurried after her and grabbed her arm. Dee Dee, are you all right? he asked. She stared at him wide-eyed as she continued to scream. Several other kids gathered around. What's wrong with Dee Dee? asked Myron. I don't know, said Lewis. Dee Dee hiccuped three times, then gasped. I saw her! Who? asked Lewis. Dee Dee didn't answer. She just stared right through him. But everyone else knew whom Dee Dee had seen. Most of them had seen her too during the last two weeks. Where was she? said Todd. On the monkey bars, said Dee Dee, still trembling and breathing hard. I was hanging upside down, and suddenly she was hanging upside down right next to me. Did she wiggle her ears? asked Jenny. Only one, said Dee Dee. I jumped off and ran away before she could wiggle the other one. That's good, said Rondi. Who is she? asked Lewis. A hippopotamus? No, said Myron with a laugh. Why do you say that? Because when a hippopotamus gets mad, it wiggles its ears. She's worse than a hippopotamus, said Allison. I saw her last week at the water fountain, said Todd. I bent down to get a drink, and then there she was, drinking at the faucet next to me. I saw her on the stairs, said Rondi. I was going up the stairs, and she went right past me, sliding down on the banister. Who? asked Lewis. Mrs. Gorf, said Dee Dee. Just saying the name sent a shiver of fear through her body. Oh, your old teacher, said Lewis with a shrug. Is she back? I always wondered what happened to her. The children looked at each other. Mrs. Gorf was the teacher they had had before Mrs. Jules took over. They had never told anyone how they had gotten rid of her. They especially couldn't tell Lewis. She was the meanest teacher in the history of Wayside School. Of course, there are other teachers at other schools who are meaner. Lewis looked toward the monkey bars. I don't see her, he said. Well, she was there, Dee Dee insisted. I saw her. You just imagined you saw her, Dee Dee, said Lewis. If you hate somebody or you love somebody, you often think you see that person when she isn't there. It's very common. It's just like Mrs. Drazzle. Who's Mrs. Drazzle? asked Todd. She was the worst teacher I ever had, said Lewis. He shivered just thinking about her. She was my teacher when I was your age. I sometimes think I see her, too, and I still have nightmares about her. Was she mean? asked Rondi. She was horrible, said Lewis. Every morning she used to check our fingernails. If they were dirty, she'd tell the whole class. Lewis has dirty fingernails this morning, she'd say in a really nasty voice. And if you talked in class, she would pick up the waste paper basket and put it over your head. You had to leave it on your head until the bell rang. 
Did she ever put it over your head? asked Todd. Lots of times, said Lewis. Everybody laughed. It wasn't funny, said Lewis. My mother always knew when I got in trouble, because I'd have bits of trash stuck in my hair. Did it get stuck in your mustache, too? asked Rondi. Lewis didn't have a mustache when he was our age, said Allison. Did you, Lewis? she asked. Suddenly, Lewis screamed. Everyone stared at him. She's back, he shouted as he shook with fear. Then he slapped himself in the face. Uh, excuse me, he said. Sorry, for a second I thought I saw Mrs. Drazzle. He turned to Dee Dee. Come on, let's go to the monkey bars. No, declared Dee Dee. I'm not going back. I am never getting on the monkey bars ever again. Lewis took hold of her hand. Mrs. Gorf isn't there, he said. You just imagined her. They headed to the monkey bars. No one else dared to follow. If she starts to wiggle her ears, run away as fast as you can, warned Dee Dee. She held tightly onto Lewis's hand. When they reached the monkey bars, no one was there. Where were you when you saw her? Lewis asked. I was hanging upside down over there, said Dee Dee, pointing. Okay, go hang upside down, said Lewis. No, exclaimed Dee Dee. Don't worry, I'll be right here in case anything happens. It had rained during the night, so the sand under the monkey bars was wet and somewhat hard. Dee Dee walked across the sand and pulled herself up on the bar. She hooked her legs over, then hung from her knees. Well, do you see her, Lewis asked. <laughs> no, it's safe now, said Dee Dee. Thanks, Lewis. I guess you're right. I must have seen my shadow or something. Dee Dee pulled herself right side up, then hopped down from the monkey bars. She and Lewis walked away hand in hand. She held Lewis's hand, not because she was scared, but because she liked him. Mrs. Drazzle sounds almost as bad as Mrs. Gorf, said Dee Dee. She was, said Lewis. She once made me put gum on my nose because I was chewing it in class. How can you chew your nose? asked Dee Dee. Behind them, Dee Dee's footprints could be seen in the wet sand under the monkey bars. There was also another set of footprints made by a person who had much bigger feet. Chapter 16, Love and a Dead Rat. Damien was in love with one of the girls in his class. Can you guess which one? He thought about her all the time. Myron threw a red ball to Damien. It bounced off his face. Huh? said Damien. Why didn't you catch the ball? asked Myron. What ball? asked Damien. The one that hit you in the face? said Myron. Did a ball hit me in the face? asked Damien. Yes. Oh, uh, good. I was wondering why my nose hurt. He had been thinking about the girl he loved. He was in love with Mrs. Jules. That was why he was always doing things for her, like passing out papers. He thought she was very pretty and nice. He thought she was smart, too. In fact, he thought she was one of the smartest people in the class. After recess, he hurried back up the stairs. Hello, Damien, said Mrs. Jules. Hello, Mrs. Jules, he said. You're always the first one here, aren't you? asked Mrs. Jules. Damien blushed and shrugged his shoulders. Do you need any papers passed out or anything? he asked. Well, it's so nice of you to ask, said Mrs. Jules. I think you're nice, too, said Damien. Mrs. Jules got him a stack of workbooks to hand out. Then she gave him a Tootsie Roll Pop from the coffee can on her desk for being so helpful. But don't eat it until after lunch, she said. I won't, he assured her. He ate lunch with Myron and DJ. He saved his Tootsie Roll pop for last. Joy and Marisha came up behind him. Hi, Damien, said Joy. How's your girlfriend? What? asked Damien. He turned red. Who are you talking about? I don't have a girlfriend. You're in love with Mrs. Jules, accused Marisha. You better watch out, said Joy. Mr. Jules might come after you. The two girls laughed. I don't know what you're talking about, said Damien. I'm not in love with Mrs. Jules. He looked to his friends for support. Myron shrugged. DJ smiled. 
Prove it, said Joy. Prove you're not in love with her. That's stupid, said Damien. How can I prove I'm not in love with Mrs. Jules? Give her this, said Joy. She handed Damien a paper bag. Your lunch, asked Damien. Look inside, said Marisha. Inside the paper bag was a dead rat. Damien knew Mrs. Jules hated dead rats more than anything in the world. Put it on her desk, said Joy. If you don't, it means you love her, said Marisha. I'm not in love with her, said Damien. Prove it, said Joy. Okay, I will, said Damien. The girls left. You don't have to put the dead rat in her desk, said DJ. We don't care, said Myron. You think I'm in love with her too, don't you? asked Damien. Myron shrugged and DJ smiled. Some friends you are, said Damien. I'll show you. After lunch, he was the first one back in class. He carried Joy's paper sack. Hello, Damien, said Mrs. Jules. Did you have a nice lunch? It was all right, he muttered. Oh, would you mind getting the construction paper from the closet and putting it on my desk, asked Mrs. Jules. Thank you. Damien went to the closet and got the construction paper. He put it on her desk. Then, when she wasn't looking, he opened her desk drawer and dumped the dead rat into it. He shut the drawer. Thank you, Damien, said Mrs. Jules. You're always so helpful. It's such a pleasure to have you in my class. Damien felt awful. Mrs. Jules read a story to the class. Damien couldn't pay attention. He kept wondering when she'd open her drawer. After the story, they had art. Everyone was supposed to make snowflakes. Damien folded his piece of construction paper in half. Mrs. Jules screamed. What's wrong, Mrs. Jules? asked Joy. Somebody put a dead rat in my desk, said Mrs. Jules. I did, declared Damien. Damien? Mrs. Jules said with great surprise. Why? Because I hate you, said Damien. You're always making me do things for you. Oh, I see, said Mrs. Jules. Should I write my name on the board under the word discipline, he asked. No, that won't be necessary, said Mrs. Jules. That made him feel even worse. Why did I have to prove myself to Joy, he wondered. I don't like Joy. I like Mrs. Jules. He felt rotten. When the bell rang, Damien waited for all the other kids to leave. Then he walked to Mrs. Jules' desk. She was grading papers. Yes, Damien. Do you want me to erase the board for you, he asked. That's all right, said Mrs. Jules. I'll do it myself. Damien sadly walked out of the room and down the stairs. When he reached the bottom, he turned and ran all the way back up to Mrs. Jules' room. She was just putting on her coat. I love you, Mrs. Jules, Damien declared. I'm sorry I put the dead rat in your desk. I did it because I didn't want everyone to know I loved you. I'm sorry. I love you too, Damien, said Mrs. Jules. You do? But what about Mr. Jules? Just because I love Mr. Jules, it doesn't mean I can't also love you. Love is different from most things. She picked up a piece of chalk. If I gave my piece of chalk to someone, then I wouldn't have it anymore. But when I give my love to someone, I end up with more love than I started with. The more love you give away, the more you have left. Damien smiled. I love you, Mrs. Jules, he said. He felt his heart fill up with more love. I love you, Damien, said Mrs. Jules. This is getting disgusting, said the dead rat. It climbed out of Mrs. Jules' desk and walked out of the room. And that is where we will end for today. Tomorrow, I will see you again for chapter 17 of Wayside School is Falling Down by Lewis Sacker. See you later.